Amen. Well, it's awesome to be here. Um, since you guys, most of you know me, I'm, I won't do the infomercial of all that we do, but you can go to our website and go check that out. Um, and if you don't, go find someone else who does, because it's good to pass on information. Plus, it's always going to sound better from someone else than it is going to be from me. So do that, because I would rather share what's, re what's really on my heart for you this morning versus taking time about what we're doing. Um, this, this, the setting of the stage this morning was really amazing, especially the word that came here and how all that tied in because what I'm sharing with you this morning it ties in so closely to what the word was this morning. So I'm not adjusting anything, I'm just sharing what's here. And I want to give you this thought is many of you are looking for, you know, we talk about destiny. What's my destiny? What's my future? What's my purpose? What's my destiny? What's my future? What's my purpose? And that's critical to your whole life. And it is something that we desperately need to know. But I'm going to give you a secret where it's found. If you don't know who you are, your destiny will become the pursuit of finding out who you are. And you're going to lose sight of what your real destiny actually is. Many people do things and pursue things to really discover who they are, but they don't do it because of what they are. And so if we can get this change, but the thing is, then how do I know who I am? Well, you'll never know who you are until you know your father, because your identity comes from your father. You don't create, it's not self-imposed. You don't wake up one morning and go, I think I'm this. What happens is when we don't have a father, we resort to an orphaned way of thinking to discover what we are on our own. And we do this, and then we create confusion and chaos, and we have a world that's desperate to discover who they are, and they go by whatever the feeling, emotion, so that mu must be what I, are, what I am, but they don't know who their father is to actually declare over who they are, because the father named the child. And so we could look at that from a natural, and we would really absolutely be without hope in this world. But God didn't come... To, to leave you without hope. So therefore, he had to come to bring the answer. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So the Father wants to share something with you this morning, because if he can get into you, for you to not just hear, not just to listen to, but really understand who you actually are to him, all of a sudden, you will pursue him and get to know him. And the more you start getting to know him, it will be like looking in a mirror, and you actually discover who you are. Then when he speaks to you things that in the past was burdensome, strong, hopeless, why are you doing this to me? Those will become, how can I eagerly get those done? You know, a lot of the things that shifted in grace wasn't so much what was needing to be done, but was the position you're in in doing them. If I were to come to you as a slave and tell you to go do something, you're going to do it because you don't want to get beaten or you, don't want, or you want a reward. Only motive. But if I come to you as a father loving a son and give you an instruction, you know I have your best interest in mind that something else is better waiting to happen. Changes everything. So I was asking God just the other day, I said, God, I know what I am. I'm still trying to, you know, it's still hazy, you know. I'm perfect in a lot of ways. No, I'm not. <laughs> It's hazy sometimes. I mean, I know the direction. I know what I am. But God, I, I, I just said, I know deep when I was a child, you spoke to me something that gave a picture of what I was to you and what my role was. I, I know what I'm doing now, but I, I just want to know, when did you talk to me as a child? When did you reveal that to me when I was younger? And all of a sudden, this thought went through my head. I hadn't thought about this in years, and he showed me the day. When I was 10 years old, we were swimming in this lake, and I had my best friend, I mean, he was my best friend in the whole world. When he moved across town, I had never cried for anything. I mean, it just, he was my best friend. 10 years old, and we went out swimming in this lake. Now, he couldn't swim. So we'd always swim, you know, stay close to shore where he can wade around. But he was on an inner tube, so he thought he was safe, and so he's on the inner tube. But we're in one of those little, you know, buoyed off thing. But, you know, I grew up in the mid-'80s. This was pre when, you know, they had concrete under the jungle gyms. Seatbelt was mom going across the arm. You know, that, that was the world I grew up in. Helmets, what, what, was, what were those for? I mean, we just, you didn't think about that kind of stuff, right? 
Because you know what? We actually were stronger because life's hard. We protect, rather than dealing with the way life is, we pat it. Then when real problems hit, we have no idea what to do, and so we have to destroy everything around us to try to make us feel better. Versus rising up to it. So anyway, my friend was in the, in, in the um, just, and just so you know if you haven't heard me, I, I, I really don't do tangents. There's a point that the point came out, just, just so you know. Well, that's not always true. Okay, so anyway, this inner tube, he's on it, he's floating around. There's no lifeguard. Parents are up on the beach, you know, sitting around doing, doing whatever they're doing. And this one kid in the pool thought it would be, or in the lake thought it would be real fun to knock him off the tube. Now, the guy didn't know he couldn't swim, but he was still being a jerk. Knocked him off the tube. Well, the area he was in was about eight feet deep. He goes down. And he ain't, it's not good. No one's doing anything. No one notices. And I'm, I'm about here to the back wall. And I see him go down. And it was interesting what my first thought was. You know, panic didn't come. But I was conscious enough, even at 10 years old, what was about ready to happen. And all of a sudden, I just took a big breath, dove underwater, and went up underneath him, and put him on my shoulders, lifted up, and walked back towards the beach. I'm 10 years old. That was no brilliance of a 10-year-old. But I realized in that moment what I was. See, my job as a minister isn't to get you to follow me, but it's to lift you to the place that you're designed to be. You see, he went down in panic, but he rose up on the back of something else, and he went out tall. And so I don't mind being piggybacked on. I found that out even in all my business, business that we're in or working in sales. Every GM loved me, and I never wanted to be the GM. I always wanted to be his assistant. Because A, I can get him out of the store so he wasn't meddling in anything. <laughs> but most importantly, what do you need done? I'll get it done. If you look good to district, we'll get good things. Let me be that person. So it's always been what I was. And I find now that the things that I do, even for ministry or coaching or everything else, is built on those things. And so as God began opening it up, there's, there's pictures that he wants to show you about who you are. See, my saving of the kid wasn't who I was. It was in that moment what I was designed to be came out. What I was designed to be came out. But I couldn't articulate because we're growing. But I need to step back a moment. There's another piece that gave me confidence in that. I knew how to swim. I didn't know how to rescue someone because my wife was a lifeguard. I didn't do the right lifeguarding thing. Because what you usually do is let them thrash around long enough, throw them something so you don't get dragged under. The wisdom to go underneath and walk them out, that, it still baffles my mind how I knew that. But I knew how to swim. I was comfortable in the water. I was efficient in the water. I had been swimming my whole entire life. I was forced into those stupid swim lessons at the local pool where they have 900 gallons of chlorine per gallon of water. You can't breathe. I remember coming home, my stomach hurt. I hated swim lessons. My mom hated Atari. <laughs> Thus, swim lessons. Didn't like it. I just didn't like anything about it. But you know, me doing the thing I didn't like to do was the thing that saved somebody's life later. See, we look sometimes at God making me do something or I'm uncomfortable. I can't believe God's command. It, it's not about not being in grace. Sometimes you don't know enough to know what you need, so just trust He is looking out for your best interest. But the problem is we don't trust His motives towards us. Let me read this to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul is writing Timothy. Paul calls Timothy three things. My true son, my beloved son, my dear son. 
Timothy cried when Paul didn't come and was put in prison. This isn't just a relationship of someone who worked for another guy and the boss isn't in town for the week. And he's getting a letter of how to run the church. This is about a guy that was so endeared to someone because Paul became his father because we don't know anything about his father. We know about his mother and his grandmother. We don't know anything about Timothy's father except Paul became it. And they loved each other. He, Paul is in prison. So imagine in the time, you're not getting an email, Snapchat, line message, Facebook, whatever, like, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? This is like, you finally get news that Paul's in prison, and who knows how long later a letter finally comes. So we don't know how long Paul, Pete, Timothy is doing his job, working hard, working hard, trying to hold this all together, and he's young, and every, he, the criticism and the, and the Jewish backlash and dealing with the world and all the issues going around, a little discouragement probably setting in, and he's like, what do I do? What am I called to do? Who am I really? What am I? All these things start coming through his head. God, what's my real, I want to do my dream. This ain't it. Until he gets this letter. Paul says this in chapter 2. So I just want you to imagine, this isn't like a father sitting around the, around the fireplace in their, in, their, in their nice lounge chair sharing a moment, eating peanuts. Hey, Timothy, hey, here's what I need you to do. This was a man that's in prison sharing something with his son. He says, you my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remember, Timothy, who you are and the position you held, hold because of grace to our Father. Remember what you are. Remember your spirit is holy. It's acceptable. It's perfect before God. Remember all those things that grace brought you. Remember that. Be strong in that idea of who you are to Jesus Christ. Be strong in that idea and who you are to the Father. That's my paraphrase. It's not in there. It's the Brian Amplified version. And the things which you've heard from me, so whatever God is charging you with, there's a charge. See, a good father loves his kids, but he charges them with something. That is not a work. That doesn't, see, if you receive the charge, means you're qualified as a son and daughter. We've interpreted instruction as a command so God will love us. The charge never came to the unloved son. The charge came to the beloved son. you got to get this, because a lot of times we've read Scripture in light of what we were not, where we are incomplete, and it became like little ticks on a box that I get this one in order. Now, in here, you guys have grown a lot, and you're not quite like that. But you're still not identifying yourself in the role that God wants you to identify when you read this. We just had a young man at, one of, at our men's uh, weekend, great young man. He grew up Catholic, strict Catholic, um, was obedient, captain of the football team, Army Reserve. I mean, he's dots in the row. I mean, he, it was embarrassing how administratively strong he was as I walked up there. What's the plan for the weekend? Mm, not telling you. It's not going to be good in your eyes. I mean, this guy just had it all. Just he, This is the way he was. And he was just telling my friend, he goes, my life's changed since the weekend. I'm like, what happened? And it was one of those little side notes that I said. It wasn't even the core thing that we were talking about. It was just a little side note. That's why the side notes are important, so write them down. The little side note. This is not a how-to book. It is not a manual for life. Because you don't have a relationship with the author of a manual. This is a letter from a father to a child based on who you are. It was written to kings. It was written to judges. It was written to rulers. It was not written to slaves. It was written to heirs and children. That's who it was written to. And if you will put yourself in the position of being the son listening to the father, this will change your 
life. This is an identity book. It's your mirror. So he says, verse 3, you must endure hardship. King James Version says hardness. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And those aren't always the words you want to hear on a Sunday morning. Hardness is when you take a sword and you heat it. Or you take metal and you're forging and you heat it so hot that you can, it's malleable and you can deal with it. Then you take it, stick it into oil and it, the temperature changes. And it hardens. You see, sometimes you're all hot for God and everything's going great and all of a sudden this wet bucket of water comes over you and it's like, where did that come from, God? God, why are you doing this? Hardness. Because then the, the blade becomes tempered and can handle things. And I'll tell you this, God's not throwing the bucket of water. And we can get rid of that picture, but see, God uses you as agents on the earth because he gave you authority over the earth. So now he works with you, so things that you face is in direct opposition, not to you, but to the identity of who Jesus Christ is. So what is the enemy after? Number one in your life. The number one thing he's after, who you are. So you think about everything that comes. Think about, just for a moment, I'll let you be self-introspective for just a moment, and then we'll get rid of self, right? Just be self-introspective. What am I feeling in the moment when the bills can't come, everything can't come? Who I am. Because if you truly knew who you were, your response would be go back to the Father. Father, who am I right now in this situation? Who am I right now in this situation? And what characteristic of you do I not understand that I need right now in this situation? Reveal yourself to me of who you are to me in this situation. And now we have the power to break the situation. Now we have brothers that are, hey, we all have moments where we need some help, right? Those are miracles. Praise God. But what is much better is when you know what you are that you can walk in a blessing. Now whichever way you want it, I don't care. God's so merciful and loving. He'll figure out a way because he wants to help. But he wants something to grow in you. No one entangled in warfare and engaged in warfare. Is, is anyone engaged in that? Remember, what's the real warfare after? Who you are. It's not af really after your money. It's not after your health. It's not af Those things just cause you to shrink. So you think where your Achilles heel is, and that's usually where he hits you every single time. And when you finally get over that, when you step up, you found out another, there's another Achilles heel that seems to be there that you never, he never bothered with because he got you on the first one. They don't, it, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life. It didn't mean you're not involved in the affairs of this life. It means you're not entangled in the affairs of this life. The, those affairs have not become a spider web to your life. You're dealing with those affairs from your position, which means you have to be in the middle of those affairs. That he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Understand this, at the time of this writing, Roman soldiers were not drafted. They all volunteered to serve for 25 years at the pay of the Roman government. You would go and a centurion would take you in and you were enlisted to that centurion. They weren't forced into this. This was voluntary, so remember that first about a soldier. Second, he goes, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crop. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. I want you just to think about this for a moment. This beloved son, this beloved son has his father giving him a charge from prison of who he is and gives him three things to get understanding on. The soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. Now 
ponder for a moment. I still don't understand your clock here. What time? Okay, good. As a coach, I, I, so we do this in Thailand, so we come back for three months. So remember what I just said. We're, gonna, we're coming back to that. I want you to ponder those three things. So when we come back for August, September, and, or September October, November, we, we coach soccer, or I coach soccer for a high school. And we test our, our mentorship program with the players. That's how that all got involved. And, and just so you know, I didn't start a football ministry. It just is there. It, it's just there, right? And I happen to love it, so it kind of worked out in both ways. We had players on our team. When I pick you on the team, when you come to the team, whether you're on the JV or varsity, we have a policy. We don't, we don't split the practices. You're on the team. They've been graced into position of the team, and I will do anything for any one of those players. Whatever they need to help with, whatever they need to do, whatever they, they I mean, they're loved, they're appreciated. Uh, many of them come to Thailand. I mean, that's, we create a family, because that's what we're fighting for, right? Because a lot of people say that sports isn't real life. It may not be real life to some, but it's real life to others. Because for a young boy, that is real life. They get to learn loss, they get to learn rejection, they get to learn pain, they get to learn discomfort, they get to learn how to train. It is real life, any more different than a, than a soldier training but not in battle. That's real life. Because they're preparing for something more. So whatever we do in life, whatever opportunity is in front of you, that, you know, it's like, well, it's not really my dream. But an opportunity is in front of you for you to stand in your position in that, give yourself to it, and learn and be best because you don't know where that's going to play off later. Side note. So I had this player. He was a captain of a soccer team. Uh, it was about three years ago. And his dad happened to be the principal of the school. He was a great kid. I loved this guy. He, he was just great. But he was really confident. And you know the difference? Like, there's this confidence, and then there's the really confident. And kind of to the point where everyone's here for him. So he worked the hardest, he did everything, but he really believed that senior year team, everybody was pretty much there for him. And he kind of assumed the captain role and kind of went with it. And uh, long story how that happened. But anyway, he, he was captain. We get away about midway through the team, and I'm getting really frustrated at watching the players becoming frustrated with this person. He is a great athlete. He was probably one of the better, best players on the team. But you could tell there was something just not sinking with the team but it's making him now look bad because no one was wanting to support him on the team. He was graced. He was loved by me. I'd still do anything for him. And he knew that. But there's a problem. Nothing was changing. So I was praying about it, and he ended up getting a red card one day for doing something that was uncaptain-like. So I finally pulled him aside and I had given much thought to this, and I said, you're done being captain. Give me the badge. And I ripped away the thing that he had worked for, for four years, to have the senior year team, him being the captain, and leading the whole entire process. There was two weeks late in the season. I can tell you this didn't go down well with mom. Dad was a little bit more understanding. But what made the difference is they all knew what my motive was towards him. You see, I didn't take away his identity. I took away the thing that he thought was his identity lied in. You guys catch that? I took away the thing that he thought his identity lied in, it resided in, that that's where he was getting his real identity. Then he was something. I'm only sharing this because I've already, I just had a conversation with a week ago of how it changed his life, me pulling him that captain's badge. After that, there was a different humility that went on. And I even made him give, make someone else a captain on the team. So he had to go give up his badge and give it to someone else. Was I being ungraceful with him? 
Was I putting works on him to perform? Was there something more he could do to re-earn it back? No. He, he, my grace towards him didn't change a bit. I immediately played him in the next game. I immediately made him a part of everything. I didn't change any of my feelings towards him. But you know what happened to him? He started serving everybody on the team. Up until this point, he would not be an all-conference player. He didn't have enough stats. He didn't have enough anything. He couldn't do it because he tried to do it himself based on a false identity. Within three weeks, his stats so dramatically changed. Why? Because the other players wanted him to get it. Because he started helping the other players get what they wanted. You see, when his mind shifted that I'm not trying to get my identity, I already have my identity, and now I'm just going to give that out with what I have, he was unanimously voted by the coaches as first string all-star, all-conference, at the end of the season. He wasn't captain, but he got voted MVP by the team. You see, a lot of things going on when God is correcting us, he doesn't use the devil to correct us. But when the devil comes in and brings a vulnerability to us, a lot of times he'll come in and say things and adjust us to bring us up to position, but we have to let go of the thing that the identity was formerly tied to. And that is called suffering. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be, to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in you. It doesn't mean if I suffer, I get glorified. It means that the glory is already in you. And as you let go of things, things start to shine in a way that you never thought would ever happen. Romans 4.13-14 4, through 14 says this, For the promise, this is referring to Abraham, that he would be the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. See, the difference was when I finally pulled this captain aside, I said, listen, you are a leader. Just lead without the badge. What was I speaking to? Who he really was? By the way, I wrote a letter in recommendation to Baylor University for a full scholarship for leadership that he was on the verge of getting, but he needed my letter. And I told them the story of what he became in the midst of something hard. He's just about ready to graduate from Baylor University. Scholarship. Why? Because he let his real identity come out. God is never taking something from you. He's releasing you into something. Always. He's always coming lower than your struggle and getting up underneath and lifting you back up when you get out. But then he wants you to learn to swim. Don't go back out and get in the tube and expect someone else to come out and keep coming taking care of you. Now, we will for a thousand years because he's so merciful, right? I mean, he, but how much better is if you would learn to swim? But the reason we don't want to learn to swim is because we don't see the benefit. What's in it for me? Paul says, at the end of this, well, let me, let me say this before I hit the end. So, Something was spoken over Abraham. He says, as it is written, I have made you in Romans 4.17. As it is written, I made you the father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. And when did he become the father of many nations? The moment God spoke it. How did he practice and train and learn how to be the father of many nations? 
In the morning, look at the sand. Count them. In the evening, look at the stars. Count them. You are a father of many nations. And when the reality of the word came finally locked into his conscious mind, Isaac is born. How long is it going to take? Who cares? At the end of the day, who really cares as long as it comes to pass? And everything he says cannot return void. The faster we give our heart over to the idea of what we are, the faster things start coming to pass. But the moment that you start seeing God as your Father and value, that presence with Him will almost be more rewarding than what can come to pass. Because we want the thing to come to pass, then we can show what we've done. You see how it's kind of a weird catch-22? The one moment's like, hey, I want to do this for you. I promise you. I want to bless you. I want to take care of you. I want, I want your life to go. Here's what I want for all of you. Here's the promise. Oh, how long is that going to be? Doesn't even have a bill today. 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 Okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Let me see. I'm going to go take care of. Maybe I'll call Joe. He can help me. Maybe I can call this. See, you're trying to be captain again. Okay, let me just tell you something about the soldier. Soldier says this, is, is this. They volunteered, were not drafted. They served 25 years of their life. You didn't come home on weekends. Many times you could be on the field for five years, three years, six years, and never even come back home. They volunteered for 25 years. They operated in, de in, in devotion to the words of the commander. They had such a discipline regime, when the, when the commander said left and there was a lake, you're swimming. You didn't give thought to anything else. In fact, on the helmet of the centurion, the ear guards are actually amplified so they could hear all the commands coming down the line because the, the, the strength of the army was the ability to respond to the command. And they moved like a machine. It was the most feared army that has ever been built, the most disciplined, the most tactical, the most brilliant of any army in the history of the world up to that time. The Roman army. Cowardice was harshly punished. In fact, they gave up a little ritual that they used to do. It's called decimating. Have you ever heard that term? Boy, they got decimated. How decimation worked is if someone came back from battle cowardly or disobeyed the instructions of the, the officer, the 10 guys in the unit would draw straws. They didn't care who did it. It could be you, but everybody drew straws. Then the other men would beat that man to death. They're decimated. Well, they got rid of the practice, thankfully. But they wanted to understand the command of the master affected every single person in the group. If everyone responded, everything worked. If one didn't respond, nothing worked. Now, God isn't putting you under that chain. So I didn't mean to kind of, God is not decimating you. I wanted you to understand the thinking of an officer. Cowardice couldn't be there. You know, God twice went and brought armies to go into battle one with Gideon, one with the Israelites going in and says, the fearful, send them home. This doesn't sound like a grace message, but just hold on. <laughs> they responded quickly and passionately to the word of the commander. Retreat was not an option except tactically. You came back victorious or you didn't come back. That, that was just their way of thinking. They didn't, they didn't do surrenders. They didn't do any of that. That was their thinking. They had built a mentality that we expect to win in everything we do. We expect to win. We follow the commander. But see, they didn't just fight for the nation. They fought for the man next to them. They gave their life for the man next to them. They expected the man next to them to give their life for them. They didn't consider their life. They trained repeatedly 
constantly with equipment that was twice the weight of what they actually carried. They had to be able to march 20 miles in five hours, full pack. I was doing the calculations that that's like almost a marathon run. But the reason they used heavier equipment was because in the battle they would feel light. You see, sometimes we don't allow God to say, hey, God, what kind of things can I do to prepare what I am as your son and push myself so when real problems happen, I can stand in confidence because of the disciplined training of swimming. When I stood and saw my friend, I was, didn't even have to think of my ability. If I was not a good swimmer, what do you think my first thought would be? I can't swim. Now I'm going to panic. But when you become secure in the words that he says, and he says, go back and think about what he has said about you. Go back and think about who you are to him. That you are the righteousness of God. That his blood has cleansed you from all your sins. Everything that we just did in communion. Do this often in remembrance of what you are. That's practice. When the enemy comes up in little things during the day, stop and arrest it. Don't wait till it becomes a big thing and a problem that you really have to deal with and you wonder why God's not showing up. He's showing up, but your capacity to handle him is going to need some help. We do this with sickness and disease and everything else. Why don't we practice on the little things? I'm guilty. I'm not pointing any fingers here. It's just like I'd rather deal with that later. It's not that big of a deal. And then when the big one happens, it's like, oh, dear God, in the name of Jesus. It's like, Thank God he's merciful, but usually I'm having to call somebody. Can you pray? Because I have not given myself to practice the things in practice. We don't have fun with God. We don't have fun. We don't laugh. I don't think Timothy and Paul just were serious all the time and just talked theology and here's what we are. There's humor. If you've ever been around soldiers not in battle, they're stupid. There's, there's a goofiness to them. And sometimes you'll see the officers with them. Now, I'm not condoning everything that they're goofy with. I'm just talking about the normal lightness of things. There's a lightness. They laugh, they joke, but by the moment that the battle cry calls, boom, they're ready to go. But that's how they get to know their officer. That's how they get to know who's in charge. How much more your Heavenly Father? He cares about your knitting and your games and your... Invite them in. Ask them your opinion. Ask for wisdom on that kind of stuff. God, how would you knit this thing? Give me a new idea. Let's go for it. I'll give it a try. And all of a sudden you start finding new creativity starts coming, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, that's what your voice sounds like. But see, you're not under pressure. You guys love waiting until you're under pressure to hear. And it could just be pizza the night before. So listen to this. Therefore, verse 10, why does Paul do this? He's telling his son, Timothy, I want you to get this. I'm not asking you to do things just to suffer. Just endure life and don't worry in the sweet by and by we'll be gone anyway. Just hang on to the end of the rope, tie a double knot, grab a life vest and just hang on. That's not how a soldier acted. That's how a coward acted. I'm not calling you cowards. I'm, I'm just giving the definition of the two. There's moments of cowardliness I've, I've experienced myself, trust me. I'm just saying, I want you to get what a soldier does. Is there fear? Yes, but he responds differently. There's always fear. Fear lurks everywhere. Anytime you do something unknown, it's fearful. But you know what happens the more you do something? that was causing fear? Do you notice it doesn't become fearful anymore? Maybe step some boundaries that normally were uncomfortable for you, that are good practice grounds. Start realizing, wow, there was something much greater in that that I ever knew. Right, like spicy food, Amanda. <laughs> it's 
So here's the secret to why. If you know who you are, your motive about why you do things will change. Because it's no longer about you. Because your father has you covered. He's already fighting on your behalf. He's already released everything on your behalf. Now he's asking you to do something not for you. I, therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, the eternal glory. See, the enemy wants us to get us so consumed with us that we can't see who we are and everything we're asking for. And God's so merciful, he'll help you. He'll help you pay a bill. There's a miracle. It's not hard. Maybe he needs a miracle today. The miracle's right here. We can just receive a miracle right now. He cares that much about you. But you know why he gives you the miracles? He wants you to know him. Because once you have a touch of him, you won't even be thinking about what you need. God, how do we get that over here? How do we get that over here? How do we get that over here? And some of you have sat in here going, but I don't really know what I'm called to do. You're called to him. Because your response after you're called to him is you look to your neighbor and say, I'm called to them. And who else? And pretty soon you passionately give yourself into the things that he desires and it becomes your desire. And the next thing, he starts giving strange instructions like go to Thailand. <laughs> I didn't go to Thailand to find myself. I don't think you went to Thailand to find yourself. I think you went on a first trip to do a mission trip and I think because of what you are, you went. See, it, it's not about going to find yourself. It's not trying to find what my destiny is. You're going to spend your life searching for that. But if you find out what you are, just like Gideon was thrashing wheat behind a, a wine cellar, and God came and told him first what he was before he ever gave him an instruction because he wanted the relationship to be solid first before the words could be trusted. And when the relationship, and he met the God of peace in that moment, that relationship launched him that when the enemy had a dream, the little bit of wheat that Gideon got to get when he was thrashing behind the wheel was a huge loaf of bread rolling over the enemy. See, whatever you've been good at, whatever you've given yourself to is tools for the next thing. Peter was a fisherman. He became the fisher of men, but he understood the ideas, the tactics, the thought process, the way of thinking. So give yourself. Give yourself first to him as a father, a good father, a dear father. And you start trusting the words that he speaks. In fact, you'll be cherishing them. Just say something to me. Dad, what do you want? Can you go get the paper? Where do you want? What, 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 which one do you want? Well, the one that's outside. Well, I'll go down and get what, Which one do you want? How can I bless you? You see, we're not blessing him because we have to. He's so blessed us. It's like, I, how, do I, how do I let you know how much I appreciate you? You've already saved my life. I'm eternal. I'm going to heaven. I'm already secured. So really, you think about it, what does it matter? How much more can I just give away of myself? It's only when I start becoming insecure in the relationship about myself. Not him. He's never been insecure about the relationship. So when I become insecure about the relationship, I start holding back and start protecting and start kind of making sure I get my ducks in order so that way I'm covered. And then someone takes one of those ducks. There's a whole lot of quacking that starts going on and the flailing in the water and all that stuff starts taking place. Amen? All right, well, God bless you. You guys, are, can I just pray over them real quick before? Let's stand on your feet. I'm going to declare this over you. I want you to listen very closely. This is to you. So I want you just to close your eyes a minute. I want you to picture God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit surrounding you. And here's what they say. 
We've redeemed you from the law. That you could receive adoptions as sons and daughters. I adopted you because I didn't want you to think that the birthing of you was simply an act that I needed to do to have more children. I didn't just birth you, but I adopted you so you would know I deliberately picked you. And because you're my sons and daughters, I'm giving you my spirit of my son into your heart that's going to cry out, Abba, Father. No more is the barrier of what you've perceived a father to be to be anymore. And the Holy Spirit will start revealing what the father-child relationship looks like and who you are to me and who I am to you. Therefore, you are no longer a slave to the systems of false identities anymore. But if, and if you're a son and a daughter, then you're also my heir, which means everything that I have built, prepared, planned, and produced is part of your inheritance. And I want to share it with you. The more you know me, the more you'll discover more about yourself then you can be like my son Jesus. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? Father, we just receive all of you. The destiny for our life is hidden in that seed of our identity. And that identity you've given us is not corruptible. It is a perfect seed. And Father, I pray that you would give us the wisdom and insight that as that seed grows, the bush is going to look different. Every bush will look different. We have the same kind, but every bush will look different. It is not our job to make fruit come on the end of that tree. But we give ourselves to you, the source of life, so that way your identity and your DNA will flow producing the fruit on our tree. And Father, we expand everywhere fruit is needed because it's your heart, because you said that it is your desire that all men would seek salvation and come to the knowledge of you. And we want no more people to know you. So Father, I just pray over every gift, every talent, every ability, every opportunity that's sitting in front of them, that they're not defined by those things, but they would give themselves to those things and the specific tasks, the specific charge, the specific direction, that you have put them here for to affect and influence this world would begin to emerge day after day. But no longer do we search for our destiny to discover who we are. We come back to you and this is who we are and now we go and influence every opportunity, every area that you give us ground to take. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, I think I know the father. And then Brian opens his mouth.